Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Neil McCluskey, Associate Director of the Cato Institute Center for Educational Freedom. Before we get into questions of whether the public schools work, if they don't, why, what alternatives there are, I guess I want to ask why public schools to begin with? Because there, there are all these things that we as a society or even our government decides is really important but then doesn't directly supply itself. So food, we give food, for food example. often you, health care. You know, we, we subsidize these things all the time but we don't set up government-run institutions that directly provide them. But we do for schooling. So why and how did we get here? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and there, there are a lot of ways we got to where we are. Um, but I can tell you best probably you know, sort of how it actually developed and then what the rationale was that was given to um, centralize government control, I guess add more government control and then over time to centralize it. So uh, you know, if we want to go back to the beginning of this country, you know, there was obviously education outside of the United States or outside <laughs> of colonial America. But we'll start there because really our idea of public schooling developed contemporaneous with most other countries and, and we sometimes looked outside to say, well, what were they doing? Uh, but you got to really start – you can start in, in England because this is really the beginning of colonial America. And in England at the time, you know, the, the 1500s, 1600s, there's very little expectation the government would have anything to do with education. Every once in a while, the, the king or somebody would exhort people, you know, please educate your children. But this was something that was expected to stay in communities and that – the church, depending on which country you're in, which church, uh, could be lots of different religious communities. But that was considered their purview because this was something actually that was directly connected to religion, to God, not really to government, although of course there were always interactions with government and religion. But so you get to the the first real people who intended to be permanent settlers in the United States. So you're not talking about really Virginia. You're talking about in New England. Uh, you're talking about the, the Pilgrims, Puritans. And they came here. And of course, this was this is actually a uh, already, relatively speaking, highly educated group of people come over, and they want to establish what is essentially a new religious society. Uh, but again, they brought these institutions that were still English with them, and there was an expectation or no expectation the government would have much say in education. What happened, though, was you know when you were in the old world. You were in these communities that were settled. You had uh, – they were often largely just extended families. So there was a lots of people looking out for the children, things like that, trying to, to inculcate the, the norm to the community. Uh, but when they got to the new world, you had a lot of people physically spreading out, moving to, to you know, lots of land available. And what the Puritan leaders thought or feared was that they were losing – a lot of what made them distinct as Puritans but also that they were going to become susceptible really to Satan because they didn't feel there was enough Bible reading, that they may have lost a lot of the religious authority. So we're talking about like right now about – Around the time of the 1690s, the Salem Witch Trials. No, or, not even there we're, yet. We're, oh, we're so before that. Okay. I promise this will not take as long <laughs> as it seems. <laughs> no, but please, this, this is interesting. This setup is really kind of crucial. Uh, so, in 1642, they actually passed a law that said, "Look, you you have to provide your children with some sort of education." Now, often that was expected to be apprenticeship, but something so that you knew your children could eventually be of you know self-sustaining, valuable members of the community. Um, but again, you had this concern about losing the religious character, losing the values. And in 1647, we get what should be something everybody knows about. Every school child should hear this. If for no other reason, it's an entertaining title. They passed something called the Old Deluder Satan Act. <laughs> and that many people point to as the beginning of public schooling. And what that said was if you had 50 uh, to 99 basically – uh, households in a town, they had to retain somebody to teach the children and teach them to read as well as Greek and Latin because the idea here was you'd learn to read your Bible and understand what your ministers were telling you. If you had a 100 or more families, you had to have somebody to teach and a place in which that 
uh, occurred. So, you know, that would usually be some sort of common building they already would have had because the reality was people were providing education. All sorts of education was going on. But the leaders thought, well, we've got to make sure that these are – we're forming proper Puritans. Citizens, I, mean, I think is a good – I mean Puritans and citizens. Well, see, at the time, Puritan and citizen were one and the yeah. same. You couldn't be considered a good citizen if you weren't a good Puritan. But this is what people point to and they say this is the beginning of public schooling because the government is saying that you've got to have these people to educate in these places where it happens for specific aims and the aim is really to, to uh, perpetuate the society. This is going to become a theme at least among thinkers about why you have public education. But anyway, so people point to this and they say, see, this is the beginning of public schooling and we've had it since the beginning. But what you have to understand is first of all that this of course was a religious community as much as a civil community. Nobody today I think would say we should really have essentially theocracies. And so much of this was driven by religion which people long believed was crucial to education and education was crucial to that. And the reality was – most towns, especially as time went on, didn't, didn't follow this because people simply didn't think that education in many cases was valuable to them. Why learn Greek and Latin when what you really need to do is have shelter? You know, you want to earn money. So you want to learn things and, and we find – they found big private schooling teaching things like double entry bookkeeping and all sorts of practical skills and a lot of towns didn't enforce this. Now, there are other reasons they didn't do it because eventually they also have to defend themselves. You know, they have a lot of problems, not just with, with uh, eventually conflict with, with native communities, but of course there's France, there's Spain, there's all sorts of old world conflicts. And they said it doesn't make sense to spend money on this. Um, and so this was not really maintained in New England and you didn't see it replicated anywhere else. So when people say this is the beginning of public schooling, that is really cherry picking what happened. That said, this idea of social reproduction is something that becomes big. So the, that makes education into – uh, the public education, not just education, which of course is different than public education. Right. That, that public education should be those things that all of us should learn and be possibly forced to learn in some way. But this makes it a sort of almost like soul craft if you're doing religious education, or at least uh, you know person crafting uh, well, in, yeah. in a bigger way. Right. I'm struck by how much what you're describing sounds like the debates today over whether we should be teaching kids humanities and the, uh -huh. the kids going off to get their you know art history degrees versus we need science technology. Engineering and math, right? And job training. That is a dispute that's been going on. I think as long as education has been taking place, do you want to emphasize practical skills or character development? Or do you, maybe do you want to do both? But that is a long-standing battle. And so now we can finally move ahead with our history, which really we won't go back to the colonies ever again. No, but yeah, but, keep going. Now this is good. So we're so, at the revolution now. Yeah. So you get to actually we're going to go post-revolution. So fortunately, we don't have to go year by year. But this is the next thing that we see is that after the revolution, we we still have essentially an education system that's, that's controlled by families and religious communities, very bottom up. There's not a lot of top down uh, dictation about what's taught, how it's taught, who's teaching it, where it's taught, anything like that. But you have sort of you know, elites among the founders saying, look, now we have this, this democratic, to use the term loosely, uh, society where the people are supposed to ultimately control what – how the, the government works and they said what we've got to do is make sure they are sufficiently enlightened that we can trust them with the vote. That's that what, seems a little bit like circular because the people who are being voted in are now instructing them to be sufficiently enlightened. And that is a, certainly a problem. But you can understand what, what many of these people uh, – their fear is we don't want a mob that suddenly has power. We want them to be you know, people who think like we do as the elites. Now, they don't think through a whole lot of the difficulty of this because frankly, they don't have much practical experience with it. And the guy who's most – cited for wanting to have a public schooling system that's big as Thomas Jefferson, sort of ironically. Although what he was saying is largely we want to have some basic education for essentially three grades in the state of Virginia uh, so that we could teach people to be very wary of people who are trying to become political leaders and, and, and office holders. But so much of the discussion was we've got to inculcate good values and of course good values were synonymous then for the most part with Protestant values among these people. There were some other founders though, uh, in particular Benjamin Rush who was the – he was actually 
best known as the Surgeon General of the Continental Army, but a pretty important guy in Philadelphia. And he said, what we really need is public schools to make everybody the same, homogeneous, and therefore make them easier to govern. So there were some people who say we want them enlightened. Others, we want them all the same so we won't fight over stuff. That's a very scary uh, concept of public schooling. But in a way, that's actually what became – the norm. And then you get into Horace Mann in the 1830s. He talked a lot about we want virtuous citizens who we can trust with the vote, but also the idea of common schooling. And he was the guy who really pushed public schooling was to make people largely the same, have the same values. And this was actually a problem in Massachusetts where he was the secretary because you had first, before Catholics came in and really muddied things, big battles between Congregationalists who were sort of the inheritors of Puritanism and um, Unitarians, which is what Horace Mann was saying, well, but what values do we teach? And so this is then we get to this idea, well, ultimately we need public schools to shape people. Eventually you also get the idea that, well, we should equip everybody regardless of their class with a basic education so that they can you know, move up and down the ladder. But you see, especially among theorists, this idea that what's really most important is that we shape citizens. We teach them to either be the same or sometimes to get along. So you go to the progressives now and they actually have a big schism. They're progressives who – We're talking about 1910-ish. Yeah, now so right, 1880s through 1920s roughly. Some who say, look, we need a system that actually – we apply science to society. We tell people where, what their jobs are going to be. We use IQ testing and things like that. Uh, and then – so we sort of engineer society and from above. And many of these above. are eugenicists. So they're, they're definitely probably into the education system. Yes. Uh, yeah. There are some unseemly <laughs> combinations of thought. I'm curious about the rhetoric that was being used because you, you say things like they thought we needed to make everyone the same so that – they could be easier governed. Was that was that actually the the language that was being used, or was that kind of the underlying message? Were they or were they saying things more like we need to instill values in these people, and they were just assuming that the values that they were instilling, which are ones they held, were uniformly correct, or were they actually saying things like we need to make everyone believe the same thing? Right. Well, so if you go to Benjamin Rush, he's very explicit in that. He says, look, we need to make people more homogeneous so that they can be more easily governed. Uh, that's not the direct quote, but that's a pretty close paraphrasing of it. Uh, more often you heard people say we need to establish these shared values largely and sometimes they were explicit in saying this means Protestant values. Um, uh, they often said, look, let's not get into the sectarian debates within Protestantism. Uh, you talk about Noah Webster and people talked about this. But we can all – there are certain things all Protestants – uh, agree on and that's what we'll teach in our schools. It's interesting though you do get into debates among these people even about uh, actually pretty s substantial debates about how much religion. So Noah Webster and Benjamin Rush greatly disagreed whether or not you used the Bible as uh, like a textbook because Benjamin Rush thought this was essential whereas Noah Webster thought if you reduce it to a textbook, it loses its power with people. I so. think Aaron hits on an interesting point though because the rhetoric – I mean very, very – you know, it's not very often that someone comes along and says like I want to control you. Uh, they usually say – well, they actually use words that you hear politicians using today. I at you go back and read John Dewey and read other people and what you hear is – uh, we need to establish foundations of our shared values to move forward into a brighter future. And of course everyone says, yes, yes, absolutely we do. Right. Those happen to be my values. Yeah. Well, you find a lot more of that when you get into Horace Mann and people who are really trying to sell common schooling. But, but Rush was, you know, I guess to his credit, was very direct in saying, look, if we're going to have people with the ability to vote and freedom, we've got to make sure they're all pretty much the same and that means shaping them early. Otherwise, you could get into all sorts of problems. I mean, remember they're looking at France and places like that, places with revolutions, often very concerned that the masses will just use power uh, in, in, in ways that are dangerous. Um, and so you could see why they were saying these things. Uh, eventually though, it really when you get to the progressives, I think they're even more um, uh, direct about it. They're saying, look, we have immigrants coming in because now you've got to understand you get to the, the progressive year. You, you have people who aren't often Western Europeans. So you're talking about Southern Europeans. People don't – you know, the Irish at least they were familiar with. But they might have been Catholic. 
Well, the Catholic thing is is huge, and and we'll get into the dangers of public schooling, I assume. But this is these are the things that animate it, and so a lot of eventually the 1840s, and so a lot of the the push for public schooling has to do with immigrants who are largely these Irish. But there's a big problem because nobody wants to, or I shouldn't say nobody. There was a lot of disagreement about whether you should incorporate anything Catholic, whether that is actually Christian, things like that. Um, But it's in the 1880s that things really come to a head because it's not just Catholics, but these are Catholics from different parts of Europe than – than you know, Northern Europeans. So there were Germans, there were Irish, but now you're talking about Italians, Hungarians, people like that, who seem even more strange. Um, and so there's an even more explicit drive to say these people must go to public schools, and they must be assimilated. And that is the role of public schools. And also, a role of public schools is to determine what your future is going to be, which not surprisingly was for the most part, you're going to work in a factory and prepare people for that sort of life, whether that's what they wanted or not. But on the flip side, you had Dewey who loved public schools. I mean, he wanted social engineering, but he disagreed with these guys. He said, look, a school should be run where it's very student-driven. What students want to do is what they do. You think kind of like Montessori or something like that. And he thought the, the value of public schooling was to bring diverse kids together. So yes, you would have to go to a public school. But it would be driven by those students, not dictated where they'll go. And that that would teach them all to get along. And actually that's part of uh, – we, we have theories now. We, uh, we have contact theory, which is – which says essentially you bring people together in pursuit of common goals and they'll learn to get along, overcome their differences. So Dewey and these other progressives really differed. And then, of course, you know, you get into the 1920s. You have Pierce Free Society of Sisters, which responds to a law that says essentially everybody has to go to a public school. And finally, the Supreme Court says, no, wait a minute. The state doesn't own you. Although if you read Benjamin Rush, go back to the <laughs> 1790s, he said, look, Public schools should teach first and foremost. You belong to the state. Let's say the, the Pierce v. Society of Sisters case is really important because it was about the right to go to a Catholic school um, and not have to go to a Protestant public school out of Oregon, which brings up the anti-Catholicism thing. In another case, uh, the uh, Meyer v. Nebraska, at about the same time, was similar too in terms of it had it illegal to teach German. Uh, and that was another thing, both about sort of creating the right types of people and coming in and saying, no, at least you have a constitutional right to teach your kid German or to send them to a Catholic school. Yeah, uh, it was a lot about really forced homogenization. We didn't want – I shouldn't say we, but a lot of people didn't want communities where people spoke German instead of English. And of course, for those communities – Speaking German was an, a, just an essential part of their identity, who they were, perpetuating their – what they thought was important. And people from the outside said, no, no, we don't want that to be legal. Uh, Pierce Free Society of Sisters, of course. Now, a huge amount of American educational history is about tension and conflict between Roman Catholics and Protestants. And what Roman Catholics did, of course, was eventually withdraw themselves from the public schooling system, saying, look, this system that's supposed to to assimilate everyone and to uh, to um, include everyone is simply incompatible with our values and we're going to start our own education system. Uh, by its peak in the 1960s, it about – I think it was about 11 or 12 or so percent of all school-age kids were in that system. But you also saw to to a lesser lesser extent but Lutheran schools that developed in the Midwest where you had more Germans. Um, And uh, and recently – take it to the present finally. For a long time, of course, a lot of Protestants were happy with the public schools. But when you get to the 60s and people say, look, we don't want our kids, especially now non-religious people or non-Christians saying, you know, we don't want our kids – doing the Lord's Prayer or something in school. And so you know, Supreme Court cases eventually said, look, you can't have religion in your schools. Well, this leads to a whole lot of unhappy you know, religious people. And so now you then see this increase in homeschooling and, and evangelical schools and the type of schools you didn't see before because these people are saying, look, this is a system that no longer serves us and we have to go outside of it. How much of what we're talking about right now is happening at the state level versus the federal level? Because so the the Constitution doesn't give. There's nothing in there about 
the federal government getting to do education stuff. So is this – all of these these issues and the – you know these conflicts, is this all happening in state-run schools? Because people I think now if we think about public education, we think about a huge amount of involvement from the federal government setting standards and funding issues and no child left behind and all these things. Was that sort of thing going on then? No, the vast majority of the conflicts we see historically uh, uh, often were at the local level because it, it's true that that public schools for a very long time were controlled primarily at the local level. Uh, now, a man would have liked to have seen this centralized at the state level, but you really don't start to see a lot of state level centralization. Uh, until the 1960s mainly and it actually is at the same time you start to see the federal government becoming involved in education. The federal government had very little to do with education. Uh, a lot of people say, no, the federal government always had a role. They'll point to the Northwest Ordinance which existed before the constitution. And of course, the Constitution does give the federal government authority over lands that don't belong to states, something like that, to dispose of those lands. But really, between you know, the, the 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 enactment of the Constitution and the 1950s, you see very little federal involvement in education, especially in K through 12 education. The 1950s, you get to the National Defense Education Act, which is a response to Sputnik. Uh, and for the first time, the federal government says, look, we're going to spend some money to have more math and science teachers and language teachers. Most of what they did was in higher ed. But that's the first time the federal government really came in and said, look, we have some role in uh, – Engineering what happens in the education system. The STEM program was to create more STEM degrees, the first one. It's the beginning of the of the STEM the STEM mania. Uh, now, of course, the, the Supreme Court had a different role. The Supreme Court, again in the 1950s, of course, Brown v. Board of Education said, look, states and districts, you can't discriminate in your provision of education. A a, a totally legitimate role in the 14th Amendment. Um, but this is different from the federal government saying, and now we're going to pass legislation to govern education. And then it's the 1960s with the Great Society. You see then the Higher Education Act, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. You see a head start. And this actually builds state control because what it does is the federal government says, we're going to start all these programs, but we're not going to hire the bureaucrats to run them. You, states, and your state offices will run it. This really balloons the, uh, the bureaucracy at the state level. And then what you see over time is the federal government first mainly just gives out money. It's supposed to be compensatory for low-income districts. But as they give it out at, over several decades or two decades really, people finally say, you know, what are we getting for this? And it's true. They're not getting much of anything. At least there's no evidence of it. So in the 1980s, and then especially in the 90s and the 2000s, then you see the federal government start to say, OK, now you have to have standards and math and reading and science and you have to have tests and we're going to require – you know, we're going to punish you if you don't do well. But so it's really only over the last two or three decades that the federal government has much to do with this. And the states only exercise a lot of control when the federal government says you have to execute our programs. And, and now would you, would you call it hybrid, like truly hybrid? in terms of how much influence the federal government is having over – because when was the Department of Education created? Well, so – It was it, Carter, wasn't it? Yeah. It was voted 1979, comes into operation in 1980. So, you know, and, and their job was to administer these grants mostly probably and maybe do studies and things like that. But now you have a partnership between the bureaucracies at the state level and the feds are just sort of pumping money in and blowing up the bureaucracies at the state level. And then there's sort of like – is there just a sort of an education complex, sort of like the military industrial complex, but now we have an education complex there's, between the two? There is definitely an education complex. Um, and, and what you see now is – maybe you could have said it was a hybrid in the 19, 1990s at some point. Uh, but you know, each – they're supposed to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act every few years. And now it's called No Child Left Behind. But it's really just the same law. But what we've seen is really starting in the 1990s when it was called the Improving America School Act. I think they stopped calling it the Elementary and Secondary Education Act because it's better – PR, if you like, it's the No Child Left Behind Act. And if you're against it, you want to leave children behind. Um, but increasingly, the federal government started to say, 
first, your structure of your education system has to be based on one set of standards, one test, and assessment of students and schools and teachers based on that test. And what they found in No Child Left Behind was if they let states do that themselves, of course they set low standards or easy tests because is it easier to push kids over high bars or just put a low bar and everybody walks right over it. So now the federal government is in the business of dictating specific standards and specific tests. Now they don't dictate by saying you will do this. At this point, what they've done is they said, look, we have been working with people who are creating something called the Common Core, which is the National Government Association Council of Chief State School Officers created it. But the federal government said, look, we are going to, first of all, through Race to the Top, which was part of the stimulus. So it's not even education primarily legislation. We're going to say you want part of this money, you have to adopt Common Core. Then they say if you want waivers out of No Child Left Behind because Congress can't agree on how to reauthorize it. So the, the executive department said, well, we'll just kind of write law ourselves. They said if you want waivers out of parts of No Child Left Behind you don't like, one of the things you have to do is sign on to the Common Core and use Common Core tests. Will we take Common Core back to um, the old debates about content? Because see, was this one of the first, uh, what sort of citizen do we need? What sort of things should uh, our children be learning? Uh, are, we, are we back to that at a federal level now? Very a, good question. And this is uh, because this becomes an interesting part of the Common Core debate. There, there's at this point, I don't think any question among people who, who pay attention to this. The federal government is at this point dictating standards. The, one of the arguments Common Core supporters use is say, oh, but standards aren't curriculum. They don't tell you what to teach. They just tell you what kids should be able to know. And in part, I think this is because they learned a political lesson in the 90s. In the 90s, the federal government actually um, uh, contracted the creation of specific standards in reading and math and, and history. And what they found was as soon as anything with some substantial content comes out, everybody finds something to disagree about and it all falls apart. Everybody dislikes it. So the Common Core people learning from that have put out Common Core, which at, the, at one time they say these are very high rigorous standards that will make us competitive with the best countries in the world. At the same time, they say there's nothing really in this. You can't you, – it doesn't require any particular reading, any particular way to do math. So they're trying to thread this needle to say very high standards but nothing anybody could disagree about. Of course, ultimately, there will be lots to disagree about and a lot of it will be in these tests that the federal government paid for. They selected the test creators. They paid for it but we haven't actually seen the test yet. That's going to fill a lot of this in. So we're heading to that debate but right now – Common Core people are, are pretty cagey. And they said, oh, no, no, there's nothing in there anybody could disagree with. What's wrong with standards though in the, in the abstract? I mean we have problems with the, the specific content of these tests or how things are administered. But, but this idea that as you said, if you let the states set their own tests, their own standards, they'll kind of – they'll set them low because they want lots of kids to clear them. Um, so what's wrong with having the federal government say, look, we want – I mean don't we – we want all of our kids to know how to read and read at a high level and do math at a high level and mm -hmm. know science and all these other things. So have the federal government say you've got to teach these kids to a high level. What's – Right. What is there to like – not like about that? Well, first thing I'll say, there's nothing wrong with standards. Uh, I get involved in a lot of Common Core debates and people are like, well, you're just against standards and I'm absolutely not against standards. So when I go to buy a car – you know, the standard is often set by road and tracks review of it or these people who actually get paid because they have expertise and they actually make money over evaluating things for me, the guy without expertise. Um, so I'm not against standards. It, on numerous – for numerous reasons, it doesn't make sense to have the federal government set standards. So the first one is lots of people who support Common Core say, look, the reason that states won't set high standards is because – it makes the job of the people in those states who have to do the educating harder. So, so administrators and teachers and not surprisingly, it's administrator groups and teaching groups, teachers groups who say don't, don't set rigorous accountability for any of this because that makes our job hard. And they have disproportionate power because of concentrated benefits, diffuse costs. They have the most at stake in the system. Obviously, kids have the most at stake, but they have they don't have no. an interest group or enough. They're yeah. not as they're not as well organized. That's as teachers, right. So. You know, the five year olds just don't yeah, do the lobbying they, they should. <laughs> um, 
And so the and, – and even parents. I mean first of all, it's very hard for parents to organize versus a union. But you have kids for a certain number of years, 14, 15 years, maybe 16 depending on how many kids you have. But after that, you're out of the system. The unions, administrators, the teachers, they're much longer. And so they have disproportionate political power to get what they want. And because they're just normal people, they're neither better nor worse than anybody else, their incentives are like mine. You know, I'd like to get paid as much as I can and not have somebody punish me based on whether I do my job well or not. And so we've seen repeatedly at local levels and at state levels, and but the farther away you go from the people that schools are supposed to serve, the worse it gets. They defeat this sort of standards and accountability thing. There is absolutely no reason to think that moving it to the federal level fixes that because if you – I mean you – You've been in D.C. Lots of people come to visit D.C. If you drive around D.C., you see giant headquarter building for the American Federation of Teachers, the National Education Association, the Association of Secondary School Principals and on and on. They're still going to have disproportionate power to bend the system to where it's lowest common denominator uh, standards, easy bars to get over. So we've moved in absolutely the wrong direction. If you want to equalize that power, you – Got to go to school choice. You enable the people the schools are supposed to serve to execute immediate accountability by saying we're leaving the schools we don't like. That's one among many problems. The other – the two really other major ones. The reality is all kids are different, right? If you, You've probably met more than one child and you've noticed that you know maybe they do different things. Maybe they have different interests. You know, I – I know that my sister and I were totally different people in school. You know, I didn't for, for a long time really care about school. My sister cared a great deal about school. We had different you know, talents, abilities, desires and it was sort of crazy to think that we should all be doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. So that – it just doesn't comply with human reality. And then the other problem is suppose there could be one best standard. The fact of the matter is – we don't know what that is. We have ideas what standards we think are better than other ones. But if you don't let competing standards or different standards compete, you don't see what might work better than what we thought was the best standard. This is crucial to innovation. You know, and even within a federal system, we talk about laboratories of democracy. You want different states to be able to try different things so that one, if you try something bad, not everybody gets dragged down. But that if someone tries something good, other people, other states can replicate it. So let's go back. Uh, uh, so we, I think we got a good full circle there. Federalization, why we need choice and now we can go back to sort of what libertarians tend to think about these ideas. But I think we'd have to go back to sort of two different things I think that have emerged for goals of public school. They may not be separable but I think there are two here. One is socialization, creating good citizens, uh, which we discussed. And another one just might be equality. You know, I don't really care that much about legislating that they learn this religion or not, but everyone needs to have some sort of baseline of equality and make sure that your ability to get an education isn't dependent upon your parents' wealth, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, it, in terms of that question, uh, in, in terms of school choice, uh, how do we how do we fix that? Is school choice? I mean, if we don't even have a voucher system, is it going to really hurt the poor, the the worst in this situation? So are you asking how does school choice deal the with the equality, quality, equality problem? It seems like it would right. deal with – it would not have centralized schools to try and make everyone to a citizen. But then there would be a lot of schools that are really bad, right? And right. Then, the, right. I think the concern is – so you give people a voucher or tax credits or something but in some way you get – give the parents a certain chunk of cash that they can use to pay for education but – that may only pay for not very good education so then the rich parents can buy a lot more or it may pay for OK. But if you've got tons of money, then you can get really world class. Right. And so we we end up exacerbating this kind of educational disparity between groups. And that's one of the things you've actually heard some people say, uh, just a, a, a little fault there, that, that they don't like – Pub private schools because they want everyone to be put into the public school 
bath or whatever, whatever an, an analogy you want to use, bin, and then and that means that they'll fight to raise the whole bin as oh, opposed right. to just get their own kids a better education. So I mean, I guess they're all a constellation of questions, but the quality question is it seems more what we talk about now than the standards question, right. right? Yeah, no, I think that that's right. There's a there's a big equalitarian argument for public schools to say, look, if you have school choice, it gives the rich an advantage, um, and and will cause greater separation uh, based on class for the most part. Um, and there, first, you have to confront the current system and be very clear about it. For one thing, while schools have an effect, most of the outcomes we're going to see on tests and things like that are based on factors outside of schools. So I think there are a lot of schools that are inefficient. I think there are schools that do a bad job. But let's be very clear that much of those, those disparate outcomes – are not because of the schools. And I actually think there's a lot of danger when we – people on the right, the left, the middle constantly say we need to fix schools to get better outcomes. We have put on blinders to the fact that there are a lot of problems. Most of the problems are outside of school that lead to these outcomes. And we keep thinking, well, if we just make schools better, we can fix this. And the reality is it seems quite clear we can't. That said, again, schools do have some effect. And the reality is – Rich people, even with public schools, have way more school choice than anybody else because you choose your schools by choosing a house, where you're going to live. That means essentially your tuition is how nice a house can you afford. That gives rich people a much bigger advantage than if everybody were given uh, you know, a voucher for $10,000 or something like that. Now, you can talk about – you could go to weighted student funding and things like that with kids with greater needs would get a bigger voucher and things. And that within school choice would be a way to equalize it. But we have – we can't ignore the reality of the current system and act like people don't already have choice. It's just incredibly inefficient choice and extremely unfair. Um, but choice it is nonetheless. Um, and the reality is what we've seen is there's always this fear that, well, you'll have these low-income parents who are dropped out, won't be able to make good choices, whatever, or won't care. And what we've seen where we've had school choice programs and studied what parents have done is usually they make very smart choices, understanding their situation. The first thing they do is they say, I want a school that looks safe. And of course that makes sense because if your child isn't safe, that's a more immediate need than if they're not learning. But with any – this is based in the DC voucher program in particular, this research. They found by the second year, once they'd found safe schools, they started to say, what are your test scores, things like that. Um, and so I think what you'd find and we see the evidence of it within the very limited school choice programs that exist is that people will become educated consumers if you enable them to become educated consumers and if you make it something that, that – Makes sense. If you don't let people make a choice, there's no reason to think that they will be informed if suddenly you do. Empower them to make a choice and they will become informed. And then, then you go back also to the, the whole thing of road and track or rich people. You know, when, when the first DVD players came out, they, they were these gigantic honking things that, that were $2,000 or whatever. See, what rich people do is they vet stuff at the beginning and then you see you know, what works. And then quickly after they've been vetted, you see much better ones, much cheaper. And that enables everybody to get all sorts of things that raise their standard of living. There's no reason to think education wouldn't work the same way. So far as school choice goes, there's three terms, three things that kind of get kicked around a lot that I was hoping you could distinguish for us or tell us and how they play into the kinds of policies you ought to have. So the first is – Charter schools, um, are they a form of public choice or of school choice? Um, and then, then the difference between – you mentioned vouchers. Um, but then I know at the Cato Institute, some of our scholars, we publish things about education tax credits. Mm -hmm. And are those the same thing as vouchers? Are they – how are they different? And is there – is one better than the other? All right. Well, you've, you've taken us sort of in the spectrum of school choice from the least desirable to the most desirable, at least in the opinion of some people at the Cato Institute. Um, but so charter schools. Charter schools are sort of like a public-private hybrid, only legally they are to be treated as public schools. So the idea was that some public entity would allow private entities that ask them 
to run schools that are supposed to be free of many rules and regulations that govern traditional public schools. The idea being then you could have innovation um, and, and to some extent competition but it was more based on innovation. And so now you have networks like KIPP schools and things like that but in many cities you all, and, and states you have kind of one-off mom-and-pop charter schools. Um, but the original idea was the accountability came from first you do have to attract uh, students who, who carry – public money with them. It could be state money. It could be some combination of state and local money. It all depends on local laws and things like that. But also to get this charter as some ostensibly private entity, you agree with the public entity to what outcomes you're going to have. Usually in a, you get a five-year charter. Now I say public entity not to be sort of overbroad, but it really depends on your state. The norm is you have to go to a school district and say, I'd like to start a charter school in your district. May I do it? You can see obviously the problems with that. You know, I'd like to compete with you. Can I do it? Um, in many places, you can appeal if the school district doesn't let you to the state and some state could be a charter you know, board of some type. Lots of different ways you could do it. But the state might override that district and say, sure, you can have that charter school there. And in some states, you, are, you could even go to a public college or university that says, we'll give you a charter. And the money could – state money could follow you using that. The, the big problems with that is first of all, there's lots of public control. Often those schools are not freed from most rules and regulations and they have to use state standards and state tests because they are public schools. So and, – and there's no religion allowed because they're public schools and the reality is lots of people want religion and education. They simply can't get it through charter schools. So – is it better than the status quo? Yeah, because these are kind of autonomous schools that can try different things and they, they do to some extent have to respond to the desires of parents because they do need to get students to get money and that's valuable. But there are lots of, of things they can't do that you'd want private education. A voucher is essentially the per pupil allocation for a student follows that student to whatever school they want to go to. So, and, that, and that widely varies, right? It's about – I think $28,000 for DC per pupil per year at the high end and then maybe down to 5000 or so on other states. Yeah, and, and I speak uh, broadly when yes. I say it's the money is attached to the kid because in almost no case is it the full amount. Usually it's just a fraction of what would have been spent in a public school. But that's the idea is at least you're taking that money, putting it on a child instead of directly allocating it to a school, which is what Milton Friedman wanted. He wanted to decouple uh, the – the funding of education from the provision of education. Um, and the idea is supposed to be you take that money to any school you want and then you know that school, you know, if it's a religious school, a Montessori school, a uh, Zoroastrian school, it you know, could be an arts-based school, whatever it is, you choose it and you agree to do what that school uh, – you, know, you agree to their curriculum, their policies, things like that and they have to you know, attract you. Uh, but, but alas, I think the, where you're going next is is what about the Satanist school? I mean, are we go, you know there's got to be some yes, limit, and that's and, where we get a problem. And right? this is actually a legitimate concern. I think a lot of people say, "But wait, I'm a taxpayer. Money has been taken from me. It's gone to the state, and the state typically." allocates it to somebody and they might take it to a school that you often hear about the, the Satan school, the madrasa. It could be Bob Jones Elementary School. There are lots of different you know, groups that people don't like and they said – and so I don't want that to be allowed. But it's gotten much more general than that. Indiana, for instance, passed a voucher program. They said, but look, so all the schools you go to have to have state standards. They have to have state tests. They have to have these books that you read. And so it's become a lot more than just – trying to keep out fringe to saying, OK, you're going to choose what we tell you to choose. And that's a big problem and it's connected mainly to the fact that people send their money to the state and they say, look, don't take my tax money and waste it or use it on something I find abhorrent or I just don't like or I don't think works. So tax credits distance the, the choice from the government even more. What the government says is, look, we're going to give you a tax credit Sometimes it's for your own child. If you send them to private school, you get a credit for that so that you're not paying twice for education basically. But more powerful are if an individual or a corporation donate to a group that provides scholarships, they get a tax credit for that donation. That 
greatly eliminates the coercion. The money never goes to the state. You don't have to choose to donate if you don't want to. You just don't take the credit then. And depending on how the law is written, you can choose the groups to whom you donate. So if you only want it to go to a group that you know is arts-based schools, you choose that scholarship granting organization. So you haven't been compelled to just hand your money over and the person you get it can take it wherever you want. You can say these are the sorts of – this is the sort of education I will or will not support. Would that be an adequate replacement for public schools in general? Because I can – you know, the fear I think is great. We're going to give you know, so some, some wealthy people and some corporations are going to get to give money to scholarships, which means now those people are going to get to control the kinds of education that are available for one. But also we have a lot of kids in this country. Are they all – are there going to be enough scholarships available for them? Because if – you know, if an education is tens of thousands of dollars a year, then even if you're giving a tax credit for a low-income family, they're still probably not going to be able to afford it. Right. But it, and this is really crucial because we spend about twelve thousand, thirteen thousand per pupil per year. That the national average. National average, right? But there's no evidence that that's what's required to actually get an education. And so you see lots of private schools. You know, people here at private school, they think of Sidwell Friends or Andover and Exeter, these places that cost as much as a college. But most private schools are usually religious schools that educate at a fraction of the amount that the public schools do. Even when you consider subsidies that come from – it could be a diocese. It could be come from the congregation. Regardless, they get – Equal or better outcomes usually at a fraction of the cost, which means you could go to these scholarship tax credits. You could go to vouchers that are a fraction of what we spend and get the same amount of education at much less money. So the problem really isn't that there's not sufficient money. Um, what is that? What, what is that data? We, we 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 publish a lot this a lot here at Cato, but the correlation between spending and yeah, outcomes is is zero. And would you say that? This is widely accepted. Uh, I mean, I know that's a big question, but I, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who dis disagree, or the money's not being spent wisely. But we've we've skyrocketed education spending, we've skyrocketed bureaucracy and administrative costs, and our performance levels are flat, if not negative. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I, widely accepted uh, among people who who study education. I think most would acknowledge that, at least across the board. There's no question that we've spent a lot of money and haven't gotten much for it. There are lots of debates about, well, but is our children today harder to educate than they used to be? Or was the money spent poorly? That's another, you know, another answer. Yeah, say. but the people who disagree publicly, they don't usually say the money was spent poorly because they say we need more money. What they'll say is, look, the kids are harder to educate today. We have more immigrants. Uh, you know, there's poverty is is higher. Things like that. Now, there have been studies that show actually they're not harder to educate now. There is a problem of, of single parent families, which does have an impact. Um, but you know, whether that's more or less, in the aggregate, kids don't seem to be harder to educate than they used to be. So the funding increase hasn't just been counteracted by kids being tougher to educate. It's pretty clear that that funding isn't helping. And then people will eventually say, yes, there have been lots of things that haven't been good that we've spent the money on. And there you know, certainly could get into questions of, well, you know, we spend more money. How much of that is wealthier people spending money on bells and whistles that they don't need? There is that problem. But even when you break it down by the income level of the districts, of the people in the districts, there's not much correlation between income and what's spent. So it's true though, the, the wealthiest quintile – spends just about the most per pupil. But the poorest quintile spends almost the exact same amount and then it's the three in the middle that spend much less. So the spending, most people I think if they really look at it say, look, that's, that, it's not that we don't spend enough. They may say it should be allocated differently. Uh, but, but the reality is outside of people who study education, most people have no idea what's spent and they're constantly surveyed saying, how much do you think we spend per pupil? And people lowball usually by $5,000 or something. And then if you ask them, well, do you think we spend enough? After they give you that, they say, no, it's not enough. Then you tell them the, the truth and they're like, oh, I had no idea. Well, that's probably enough or maybe we should spend a little less. So it's the public really doesn't know what's spent. Related to this funding question, um, I have another question that maybe 
very difficult to answer but is one that comes up all the time in debates about education, which is teacher pay. Like we're constantly told that our teachers are this suffering underclass who are paid almost nothing mm -hmm. and that you know public school teachers are so important to the nation's future that we ought to radically increase their pay. I think I both had someone because, told me that there was no pay that was too high. Yeah, but, <laughs> but the, <laughs> and the, the, like the argument uh -huh. for it takes the form I think both of – you know that they they should be paid more because then they'll will get better results out of it, but also because they should get paid more just out of a sense of fairness that their their value mm -hmm. to us should be reflected in their pay and it's not currently. Right. So there are problems with this on two levels. One is what are they actually paid, and then the second part is how should they be paid. So uh, usually when you hear about teacher pay, you just hear well their salary is X, and other people have salary of Y. No adjustments made for the amount of time worked. Once you adjust for the amount of time worked, which is both you know that there's summer vacation usually, but also how many hours in the day when you are working, do you work? The reality is teachers certainly do a lot of work. I mean it's not just what they do in school. There's grading at home and things like that. But they've done time diary studies. They found they don't really work the weeks when they are you know, on the job more on a daily basis than most other professionals with similar educational backgrounds. And then once you then control or, or you calculate an hourly wage as opposed to just a salary that's based on far fewer hours, you see that they get paid equivalent to accountants and uh, to, to lots of other similarly credentialed professionals. So then that sort of takes care of the question of, well, are they grossly underpaid? If we as a society think, well, we know what the right amount is for a teacher to get paid. But of course, that takes us to the second problem. Is every teacher identical? Of course they aren't. But when you have a government monopoly system, the tendency is to pay them as if they're identical because you – it's just easier to have one set way to pay people. And that's why, again, the problem is ultimately the system. So there probably are teachers who provide great value that lots of people would be willing to pay a lot, but they can't get that pay. They can't go to the school that everybody wants that can then charge more because people are willing to pay it because they get better outcomes and then all the teachers get paid better. It's you're in the school district. You get paid the same as everyone else. If you are a math or science major who could command a lot more outside of teaching, sorry, you have to get paid the same as everyone else. So on a very broad average sense, teachers are not underpaid if at least you say relative to other professionals. But the reality is we shouldn't teach – we shouldn't treat teachers as if they're monolithic. We need to te treat teachers as individuals. And the problem is we have a system that's simply incapable of doing that. So there may be teachers who should get paid $100,000, $200,000 a year. You see in Korea people who are tutors who teach kids online who are very effective tutors make tons of money. Um, and we need to look at that sort of system, rewarding individual teachers based on their performance and the demand for them rather than say, well, all teachers are overpaid or underpaid because that just doesn't make sense because all teachers are different. Um, so a lot of times when I'm uh, talking to particularly teacher friends, uh, which I have a few, um, sort of come up with some of these ideas and, and see what they think about them. But a lot of what I hear from them is that you know the problem is not – the administration or the lack of choice or the money, the problem are the parents. The, the parents are the problem. I, I get the kids uh, 12, you know, eight hours a day maybe if you just have one period with them, you know, eight hour, mm -hmm. one, one hour a day, uh, five days a week and they get them for the rest of the time and I'm expected to turn them into a, a great uh, scholar. Uh, you, you know, I, I can't do that. So how do we – Look at that problem uh, and, and address it within a, a choice system. Well, that I mean, that's absolutely a crucial point. Now, there are lots of reasons people might say the parents are the problem, but we've seen very clearly. I mean, as close as you can get to a law in social science is that so, what happens outside of school is going to have way more impact on what happens inside the school. If you just think that how important the first five years are in your development. Um, most of which happens outside of school, not to say we want to put them into government schools because there's no evidence pre-K works either. But we, maybe that's another podcast. Uh, but in any event, 
it's, it's absolutely true that those influences are much more powerful than what happens in school. That said, that can be used also as an excuse to say, well, look, there's nothing I can do about it. It doesn't matter what I teach them. I shouldn't even try. And you know, you may have teachers who do that. I don't suspect that that's the case for most teachers. I think they're saying, look, it really is difficult to overcome these problems. And I think as a society, we all tend to assume that schools could ameliorate these problems and they just can't. But do we see evidence that, that teachers uh, are, can be demonstrably better? than other teachers? I mean yeah. that's one of the things this can be used right. to say. It's like you give this to the best teacher in the world. They're still not going to be able to do anything with them. But is there evidence that shows that teachers – there's a difference in quality? There is definitely evidence that you can begin to find that some teachers are better than others. The problem is it's hard to do it with hard numbers. So there's this – there's a big debate within education now about something called value-added metrics where you're supposed to use test scores and you would take a teacher and say, well, what's the average – gain in test scores for their students. The problem is you have to then control for lots of things that happened to the student beforehand. Uh, you have to average what their gains were in previous years and average those things together. Ultimately, this value-added metric becomes a very difficult thing to do. So lots of people are trying to say, well, can we also add then observations of teachers and things like that? And I think the reality is that intuitively, other teachers and principals and things have a pretty good idea of who's good or not, but it's hard to just to say definitively we are 100 percent certain based on this algorithm that this person is really good. Of course, when you're in a business or something, very rarely do they just say you are hired or fired or promoted based on our algorithm outcome. But in education, government run, people say it better be something that clear cut. How dare somebody deprive me of my government job? Uh, they don't usually put it that way. But that's the background is this is government either hiring you or firing you saying – how can you just let this principle subjectively determine that I'm no good and I should be follow, fired? And you know, there could certainly be problems with principals having personality conflicts because they generally don't get rewarded based on how successful their school is. So why not just make it easier? If you don't get along with a teacher, try and shuffle them out. So there are very real concerns here. It's also, I think, important to note that sometimes you know, parents can – they may care so much about their kids that they come in and become very bossy and bullying. That could certainly be part of the problem and it, and it happens from time to time. It happens – my wife is a teacher and I – it Especially happens more than kids. from time to yes. time. Yeah. Well, the gifted yeah. kids definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, and so in a way, I mean you want those parents to be engaged but you also don't want them bullying you and saying you better give uh, Johnny an A or ignore what they just did. That was terrible because I said so. And what I think you'd see in school choice is that schools often would be able to say to those parents, look, you are making this very hard for our, to do our job. They may ultimately you know, get evaluated. Take your business elf elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. They'd say, we don't want to work with you. And you would certainly see other private schools say, yes, we want the money. We'll take care of you. We'll, we'll take, do what we can with your, your son or daughter. Um, but you, you empower the schools to a much greater extent too than saying, well, they have to take you. Um, and this is a, a big argument. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's not fair that private schools don't have to take everyone the public schools do. Well, the big problem might be that the public schools do have to take everyone. They have to try and be all things to all people even though they may be just the one school in the district and that's incredibly hard to do. The one thing I'd just quickly add though is when you see surveys of teachers, usually their biggest complaint isn't that they're underpaid. Most don't seem to think they're underpaid. Um, it's usually that they don't have enough control over what they teach. They think too many rules and regulations. How radical should the choice in school choice be? I mean, so should schooling be compulsory? Well, so this is, gets into to murky ground. In fact, libertarians debate this among themselves. Well, you bring up children, it makes us often confused about what, what sort of principles right. we apply. And this is important because libertarian is usually about people who are capable of self government. Of course, children aren't, unless you have a very precocious child. <laughs> um, so. Here's what, what, what I think. But I, again, this is open to debate. I would not ideally – now, let's be very clear. You cannot go to ideal from where we are now where people – everybody for the most part assumes somebody hands me at school and I go to it. Um, but ideally, I think what we want is a system where everybody is required to make sure their child gets an education. I think we don't though say – that means everybody has to send their child to school. I think we treat it like we treat a lot of other things. If there's suspicion you are not 
educating your child because I do think we have children – and this is what you know, Locke said among other people. You, know, you have a duty to your child to educate them. And if somebody from the outside says, look, you, this person is not educating their child, then authority should come in, investigate and same as any sort of child neglect. Say, OK, you need to do this. Otherwise – and there has to be a certain level. Now, where do you draw the line? That's tough to say. I think you know, the Supreme Court has said eighth grade. That's what they said for, for the Amish was. You know, that should be where you have to take them after that. Your community can decide. Uh, I would say that you need to make sure that all kids are literate and numerate so that they have the basic tools to then pursue other education as they choose as they go, grow older. But the baseline should be the government's job is to make sure everyone's getting educated by you know, policing when people don't do it and that should be it. And here's where history again becomes very important. Most historians, even those who support public schooling, will acknowledge that most people were getting an education before there was public schooling. Literacy in the United States was very high before there was public schooling. So the reality is most people will educate their children biologically. There's been research that shows we have a, a, like a chemical attachment to our children to want and to be compelled to get what's best for them. So th most people, they think if it's not compelled, no one will do it. But the reality is people did do it and there are lots of reasons to believe they would continue to do it. So just because you don't say it's compulsory doesn't mean people won't get education. Generally what it's saying is they'll choose their own education. We won't have to fight about all sorts of things, what they're taught. You'll have innovation. You'll have individualization, knowing that all kids are different. You'll have a much better education system. But you should have that backstop where if people are neglecting to supply what their children need so that they can become self-governing adults, that is when the state has a role to step in because you are inflicting harm on that child. So as a final question, um, yeah, you kind of broached on it there, but uh, I think you can, there's two elements to this question, uh, which I think you can bridge together. One of them is, is sort of the last objection that's on my mind that I get from the advocates for public schooling is what about those who slip through the cracks? Because at some, end of the, at some element at the end of the day, it sounds like even in the system that we would be advocating, uh, I mean you just said the state would have to step in, but uh, that, that could be at a very low level. Um, that At the end of the day, there would be someone who slips through the cracks and they don't get an education. The state misses them. They don't enforce this. And the public education system is there to make sure that nobody slips through the cracks. Uh, so that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is um, – your hopes and dreams about what the future can be, uh, 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 the, the kind of tying those two together. I think you, I think you can see the point of how you can tie those two together. Right. What, what are the possibilities that we don't have? Um, so that's the upside. Uh, what are the possibilities that we're not experiencing right now that we can't even imagine that a, a choice in education could bring? Right. Well, so the first question about people falling through the cracks. Obviously, that's a concern, and and I think when we say that. You know, people – that the state has a role if it appears that somebody – a child is being neglected that, that the state then steps in. And often this is because there are problems that happen before education ever occurs. Um, then we need to always compare to the current system. And the fact of the matter is all sorts of kids fall through the cracks all of the time. In fact, uh, there was an uh, op-ed. It might have been 2002 or 2003. I think it was on the Washington Post um, where this person was writing against school choice saying, look, I was in the subway. It could have been the metro. I can't remember where they lived. And, but I saw this child who looked to be in bad shape who should have been in school. And how would school choice ever help them? And I thought – you are writing when the predominant system is a public schooling system and you are seeing this child who looks to be neglected, who should be in school, who isn't. So how is that system taking care of them? And what we've seen with school choice is parents will actually be better advocates for their children, be more energetic about their children when they feel that being energetic can actually cause something to happen. If you just say, as we often see in the school system, and this goes back to sort of what people are saying, the parents are the problem, you often see where people say, look, well, you look, the public schools do what they can, but parents just aren't doing their job. Well, I mean, if that's what you say, then the public school system isn't being that backstop anyway. They're just saying, well, I can't do it. It's a problem for both, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, then this, this gets into what I really think – this might not be the revolution you're talking about. Like a lot of people think if we have school choice, you'll have more online education, lots of new innovative ways it's delivered. But I think what will really be valued, valuable is 
if you go to school choice, I actually think you will get more of what the public schools were supposed to provide, which was kind of this social cohesion. And a lot of this goes back to – this goes to social capital theory. James Coleman's done a lot of work on this. But you will form real communities when people get involved in schooling and they choose schools that have shared norms, shared values, maybe shared just what they teach. But that builds meaningful bonds between people where they will begin to look out for other people's kids. Um, they will begin to have sort of this mutual affinity. We won't all be atomized, just basically going where the government tells us to, arguing about what's taught and then just accepting some lowest common denominator and hoping we get through within 13 years and get into a good college. And I think that's the real value of school choice is it will end divisive conflicts. It will let people choose schools based on shared norms and values and most importantly, because people say, look, but won't that lead to balkanization where you know, all, the, all the Catholics will go to school together and all the, you know, the, uh, all the people who uh, you know, like uh, arts will go to school or whatever. But the fact of the matter, what we've seen in the beginning of research into school choice is the building of meaningful bonds when people, for instance, choose a private school and they're people from different races. They see greater bonds between those kids in those private schools because they've chosen something where the bonding power of what they've chosen overcomes the division that's based on race or something like that. So what I think school choice would do is actually lead to the outcomes much more efficiently and effectively that we wanted from public schooling, which is people being unified, coming together and, and, and becoming sort of a cohesive whole without – losing lots of the individual things that make them distinctive that are crucially important to them as individuals. In other words, you sort of marry individual liberty with social, even national cohesion. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.